we look at the 200 week moving average as, as an important indicator um, just to put in perspective the, the market activity, um, how big the drawdown is that we've seen versus past cycles. And if you look, uh, the 200 week moving average, Bitcoin's only touched it seven times in its history. And it, it touched it uh, when it broke below 22,000 uh, earlier this month. And uh, historically, that's been a good time to average into Bitcoin. Uh, not a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold anything, but um, the average returns of Bitcoin 12 months out after breaching the 200 week moving average is over 200%. So historically, it's been a good indicator of capitulation and uh, a bottoming event, though not necessarily predicting or indicating the exact bottom, because we see times where Bitcoin's price drops dramatically uh, quickly below and then and then recovers um, uh, sometime after. Um, so it's kind of just a, a global signal that we'll, we're, we're close to a bottom, though you need to look at the more specific on-chain indicators to see uh, where that bottom might actually occur. Um, so, so seeing uh, Bitcoin now reclaim that 200 week moving average just last week was the second week in a row that it's closed above it uh, is a sign that we may be more getting more bullish heading above those, uh, those ultimate lows. Um, I think it's still important to put this drawdown uh, in context to previous drawdowns. So Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin in general for global bottoms has typically bottoms below 80% drawdown from all time highs. Uh, COVID was one exception where the drawdown was very quick and there was the V-shaped recovery in, in pretty much all assets uh, where it didn't. This time as well, we didn't get down to those 80% levels. Um, so if there was, say, um, you know, increasing macro headwinds that drove the whole market down, if equities reach new lows, I don't think crypto will be spared. Uh, that you know, ultimate low looks around the 13 to 14K range. Um, so we're not ruling that out as a possibility. Uh, but at least crypto specific, uh, things are looking a lot healthier now than they were, uh, say, the past three months. Um, and I think, you know, just to put in context what's happened that's driven a lot of this chaos in the market, really starting back in May with the collapse of uh, the Terra and the uh, UST stablecoin, that was a, like a $50 billion event. If you look at the 20, million market cap of US, 20 billion market cap of UST and the 30 billion market cap of Luna, that really evaporated overnight uh, and also had Bitcoin specific selling pressure in there because the um, the Luna Foundation guard was buying Bitcoin to backstop that peg, which obviously didn't work. Um, but that was a massive selling event. The markets all sold off from it. Uh, and then over June and July, we saw the contagion of that event uh, start to show itself in the market. Um, we, we had a strong feeling there would be some. We didn't know exactly who would be affected. Uh, two of the main ones that turned out to be Celsius and Three Arrows Capital. Um, Celsius, they both had exposure to Terra. Um, Three Arrows taking a big bet uh, on that ecosystem took a big hit to their balance sheet that rendered them unable to weather two other trades that they made that also went bad. Uh, uh, one of those was the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Um, as that discount widened their trade uh, move against them. And then also the uh, Lido's Liquid State Deether. Uh, that they had a large position in as well, was also trading at a discount. Uh, these two products trading below spot um, essentially uh, put them underwater in a way that um, rendered them unable to meet um, their uh, margin calls, uh, which it also turns out they were borrowing for pretty much everybody in crypto. Um, so that we learned kind of throughout the entire month, more and more about that story. Three Arrows, you know, at their peak was managing between 10 and $18 billion. Uh, so we went from a $50, $50 billion accident in Terra, you know, 10 to 18 in uh, Three Arrows Capital. Celsius as well, which halted um, withdrawals on their platform, ultimately filed for bankruptcy in the beginning part of this month. They were managing over 20 billion at one point. Um, the, the, the tail has been getting longer in terms of who's been halting withdrawals, filing for bankruptcy. Uh, but the the actual magnitude of those events, if you look at, you know, even a, another lender, uh, halt or not, which I hadn't heard of before, but paused withdrawals this morning, uh, much smaller in magnitude. And it seems like that overall contagion has now been contained to some extent. So I think it's important to look at how much of the activity in the network, where supply is shifting from kind of these short-term speculative holders to long-term holders that are going to 
um, be supporters of the network in the long run and aren't just here for that kind of speculative trade. And as you see markets kind of reaching tops, you'll see that short term holder base really grow in terms of percent of total supply. We define, uh, we use Glassnode's definition of a, of a long term or short term holder, which cuts off at 155 days. So you, you hold coins in your wallet and you haven't moved them for 155 days, basically. That level hits you into the long term holder bucket. And during this bear market, we've seen long term holders accumulating supply. Uh, so just over the past year, for example, plus 6% uh, on the long term holder supply base. Uh, that generally means that um, there's a stable cost basis establishing, uh, less speculation in the market, um, more long-term supporters of the network. Um, interestingly, similar metric is also um, locked supply, which uses a, a different uh, heuristic to get at the same kind of notion of, of this long-term holder versus the short-term speculative holder. Uh, which uses a, a, a pr probability that Glassnode has uh, come up with to identify the probability that a supply, uh, a token uh, will move out of a wallet. Uh, so the, the realized price is the aggregate cost basis of the market. If you looked at the price that every coin was last transferred at, and that gives you a sense of the, the overall kind of cost basis of investors. And when the, the market cap or the individual price per Bitcoin drops below that realized price of that cost basis, the market's net underwater. Uh, coins are trading below where the market last priced them at when they moved. And we saw during, uh, during this cycle, Bitcoin's price drop below that cost basis, typically another indicator of that kind of bottoming of that. It's not the ultimate bottom. There's other cost basis that we look at to see where a more accurate signal of the kind of ex what might be the exact bottom uh but overall breaching that market cost basis and then now just uh beginning of this month and end of july getting back above it uh typically a, a bullish sign uh in terms of percent supply and profit this is less looking in aggregate of pricing all the assets at uh where they last moved in the current market price and instead looking at individual positions and how much of the supply of bitcoin uh, is in profit. And so coins that were last moved a long time ago, say in the previous bear si uh, uh, bull cycle or bear cycle, uh, there's still a good amount of profit in that system uh, overall. And so that's what leaves us kind of neutral there. I think it's, I think it's definitely dangerous to say that, uh, you know, the network's more adopted, so we'll never reach lower lows. Uh, that obviously could happen. But I think overall, there is truth to it. Um, there is a more distributed holder base. And Crypto now is seen um, is more legitimized as an independent asset class. Um, I think that's one of the big things that's changed in this cycle versus previous cycles is nobody's um, nobody knowledgeable of the space is saying, "Oh, crypto is going to totally go away." Now they're saying, "Crypto's here. How are we going to deal with it?" Uh, and I think that's a big change that that uh, contributes to this quite a bit.